welcome to the next lecture in electric circuit analysis we are discussing the transfer function here in this particular lecture so transfer function is basically the key concept that is required by the signal processing as it indicates how the signal is processed and is passed through the network so when the signal is passing through the network how the signal behaves that key concept can be learned with the help of the transfer function so it is a very vital tool that can be used for numerical circuit analysis now where do we use that so we use the transfer function as a fitting tool for finding the network response we used in determining or designing the network stability or we used it for network synthesis now there these three basic areas where the transfer function can be used and that is is a very vital tool in the field of numerical circuit analysis transfer function of a network basically describes how the output or the response behave with respect to the input or the excitation so when you give the excitation how the nature of the output is there that is basically defined in terms of the transfer function so it specifies the transfer from the input to the output in the laplace domain or the s domain that we have studied previously assuming that the, there is no initial energy stored in the inductor or the capacitors so we will study this transfer function as the output to input relationship in the s domain considering no initial energy now how the definition of transfer function is defined let us see so the transfer function is given by h of s which is the ratio of the output response now output response is y of s when we say y of t it means the output is in time domain so the laplace variable of y of t is given by y of s so we are required to find the ratio of the output to the input output is basically the response and input is basically the excitation so input is represented by x of s which is basically the laplace transformation of x of t now all initial conditions are set to zero so we don't have any current or voltage present in the inductor or the capacitor we require to determine the ratio so transfer function is the ratio of the output response to the input excitation and this is governed for any linear network so given a linear network we can define h of s or h of omega we know that the value s that is in laplace domain is equal to j times the omega where the omega is basically the frequency in radian per second so given the input we can measure the output and find the ratio to determine the transfer function the input and the output can either be the current or voltage at any place in the circuit so we can either give the current input and measure the voltage output or we can uh, give the voltage input measure the current output or the voltage output so there can be different combinations of current and voltage in the input output relationship so depending upon the different combinations of current and voltages we can define the transfer function which is the ratio of output by input quantity as four possible values what are the four possible values when we are determining the ratio of output voltage by input voltage then that is known as the voltage gain when we are determining the ratio of output current by input current that is known as the current gain when we are determining the ratio of output voltage by input current that is known as the impedance when we are determining the output current by input voltage that is known as admittance so combining the voltage and current we can determine the ratio of output by input combination and that is known as the transfer function h of s now note here that when we are obtaining the ratio of two quantities which are having the same dimension then h of s 
becomes dimensionless. So H of S is dimensionless when the output quantity and the input quantity are of the same unit then H of S is dimensionless. Now let us see how to apply the transfer function in the circuit analysis. So as we know that the transfer function is the ratio of output by input so we can write y of s that is the output is equal to h of s into x of s. Now if we consider a very special case where the input function or the excitation is delta of t which is the unit impulse function. So we are giving one input or excitation which is unit impulse function then the Laplace transformation of del of t is equal to 1. So x of s is equal to 1. We can say that the output y of s is the transfer function of the system. So if we find the inverse Laplace transform then the output y of t is equal to h of t is equal to Laplace inverse of h of s. Here the h of t is known as the unit impulse response. So that is the time domain response of the network to a unit impulse. So unit impulse is del of t. So when we are putting the input del of t and we are determining the output y of t which is equal to h of t is known as the unit impulse response of the system. Now once we know the h of t that is the unit impulse response of any network we can obtain the response of the network to any other input signal. So whatever may be the input signal we can easily determine it given the h of t of the network. Now let us solve one problem to understand the transfer function. So the output of a linear system which is a time domain is given by the following function. When the input x of t is given by one function, we have to determine the transfer function and the impulse response of the system. So output in time domain and input in time domain is given to us. So first step is that the input and output both in time domain function has to be converted into the Laplace domain x of s y of s. So the Laplace transform of x of t given the input signal is 1 by s plus 1. So x of t is e to the power minus t u of t. So this we have studied in the previous lecture how to obtain the Laplace transformation of a particular time domain signal. y of t the output Laplace transformation y of s we can obtain. Now we can divide or find the ratio of the output response by input excitation to find h of s which is the transfer function of the system. Now the second part of the question asks how to find the impulse response of the system. So impulse response of the system is nothing but the inverse Laplace transform of h of s which is the transfer function. So we have to obtain the inverse Laplace transform of h of s to get the impulse response h of t of the system. So we can get the final result in the time domain. Next problem there is a circuit oriented problem. So given a circuit which is having inductors and the capacitor we have to find the transfer function which is basically v0 by i0 where v0 is the voltage across the 2 ohm register and what is the current that is flowing through it and I0 is basically the input current drawn from the source. So let us see how to find the solution. So in order to find the transfer function we can apply the circuit theorems that we have studied in the previous lectures. First we will be determining what is the current which is flowing through the register 2 ohm given by the notation I of 2. So I of 2 in the Laplace domain we can find out in terms of I0 using the current division rule. So we can find out what is the current which is flowing through 2 ohm register. So this is very easy we have already learned how to find that in the previous lectures. 
V0, which is the voltage across the 2 ohm register, is nothing from the ohm's law 2 into I2. So, we will get the value of V0. Now, the transfer function is the ratio of the output voltage by the input current, which we can get it in the function of S. So, these type of circuit problems, all theorems that we have studied, we can apply and then we can take the ratio of output to input to determine the transfer function. Now, next topic is basically the poles and zeros of the transfer function. So, we have seen that any transfer function is basically the ratio of output quantity by input quantity and those can be represented by a function having the numerator polynomial and the denominator polynomial. So, we can find a ratio in terms of numerator polynomial and denominator polynomial. Numerator polynomial when expanded it will be a function of s with the coefficient value. Similarly, the denominator polynomial will be also a function of s with some coefficient k. So, once expanded, we can get the numerator polynomial and the denominator polynomial. This numerator and denominator polynomial can be grouped to find the roots of the numerator separately and the denominator separately. And there is some constant which is taken out. So, the constant is nothing but the highest coefficient of the highest power of s divided by from the numerator side to the highest coefficient of the s in the denominator side. And then we have some terms z1, z2 to zm in the numerator, p1 to pn in the denominator. So, when we try to find the roots of the numerator polynomial with equating to 0, that gives the zeros of the transfer function as they are making the transfer function to be 0. So, the roots of the numerator polynomial are known as the zeros of the transfer function because they will make the transfer function to 0. Similarly, when we talk about the denominator polynomial roots, they are known as the poles of the transfer function because they will make the transfer function to infinite. So, the zeros are the roots of the numerator polynomial, poles are the roots of the denominator polynomial. Now, some properties let us see. If the poles and zeros are not repeated, they are known as the simple poles and simple zero respectively. Otherwise, they are called multiple poles and multiple zeros. So, it depends whether the poles are repeated or not. So, depending upon that, we can say whether it is a simple pole or multiple pole, simple zero or multiple zero. Now, if the poles and zeros are complex in nature, then always they will occur in the conjugate pairs. So, any poles or zeros which are in the complex form, they will occur in the conjugate pairs. The real part of all the poles must be negative and any pole on the j omega axis must be simple. So, next topic we are going to study the S plane where we will see the j omega axis and the real axis and how these poles and zeros are located in the S plane. So, S plane is nothing but a two axis plane where the real part is known as the sigma and the imaginary part is known as the j omega axis where the poles and zeros are located in the x plane. The pole is represented with a zero and the, uh, so the zero is represented with a sign O and the pole is represented with a sign cross. The location of the roots in the S plane provides an insight into the nature of the network function and this information is used in the network analysis and synthesis. So, the poles and zeros plays a very important role in the network analysis and synthesis because by changing their position in the S plane, we can get different form of the network and the circuit dynamics will change. Let us solve one problem. So, this is the transfer function given in the form of impedance. We have to obtain the pole zero diagram. So, we need to find the roots of the numerator polynomial and the roots of the denominator polynomial, find the poles and zeros and obtain them in the S plane. So, first we will determine the poles. 
so the roots of the denominator polynomial we will equate with 0 and try to find what are the roots involved in the denominator polynomial. So we will find the two roots that is present in the denominator polynomial because the highest power is s square. Now the zeros can be found from the numerator polynomial by equating with 0 and finding the roots. We can see that the highest power involved is uh, 2. So we will have two poles which are complex in nature and one pole which is one zero which is separated out so that will give you a simple zero. So we can find the zeros and we can find the poles and now these zeros and poles which are the roots available from the denominator and the numerator function can now be plotted in the S plane. So the real part is known as the sigma axis and the imaginary part is known as the j omega axis. The zeros are represented with O symbol and the poles are represented with cross. So we can see that whenever we have the complex poles or complex zeros, they will occur in conjugate pairs. And whenever we have some simple zero, they will be plotted as such. So here you have S of 0 which is nothing but the origin. So since it is a 0, we represent it with a 0 symbol. Other poles and zeros can be represented in the form of O and cross. So given the transfer function, we can obtain the pole 0 plot in the S plane. So this complete uh, the lecture on ba basic fundamentals of transfer function. In the next lecture, we will use the transfer function concept to carry forward the analysis of the network.